Hello, I'm Jerry Godwin, and I'll be bringing from you the Sunday School lesson today entitled, The Promised Messiah, and it's taken from Acts chapter 2, verse 14a to 22 through 32. That's Acts chapter 2, verse 14, the beginning of verse 14, to 22 through 32. And next Sunday, don't be confused, is uh, entitled The Forgiving Savior, and is taken once again from Acts chapter 2, beginning with 14a, and then verses 36 through 47. And I hope that you all had a wonderful and blessed Easter, and that we celebrate um, the risen Messiah, our Savior, who gave his life for us, and also has prepared a place for us in eternity, that if we are obedient to him and by his grace and mercy, we will be sharing eternity with him. But um, as we begin, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we praise your name this morning for the wonderful name of Jesus, that the name that is above all names, that one day that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant God, Lord, that, that has um, been faithful to us, and we can trust him, and he alone is worthy of our praise. Hear, O oh Lord, our prayers of the individuals that are praying at home, and, and Lord, just hear their prayers and bless them, and we just ask all the things that your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that he will be glorified. Amen. Um, the promised Messiah, when you think about Messiah, you may think about the um, um, composition by um, Handel of the Messiah. And every Christmas, often we hear the um, the the presentation of Messiah. Well, it's one of the most common common um, songs that, and that is sung, and this was performed first in Dublin, Ireland in 1742. Now, Handel, at the end of his manuscript, wrote the letters S-D-G, which stands for Soli Deo Gloria, which means to God alone the glory. To God alone the glory. And that's the way that Jesus led his life, that he would be obedient to God and that God would receive, God the Father would receive the glory. And that's certainly a goal for all of us Christians that we should live our life in obedience to Jesus Christ and especially at this time in the year. And, and we just had Easter and we are um, studying today some of the um, uh, Pentecost sermon that was delivered by people, Peter, of all people. Now, we know, as we've studied, that Peter, during the Passion Week, denied even knowing Christ as, 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 as the Messiah, and he denied him three times. But this was the same Peter that in Caesarea Philippi, when he asked the disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said that you are John the Baptist, or Jeremiah, or Elijah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus asked his followers, his disciples, and he asked, well, who do you? Who do you say that I am? And this is the question that all of us have to answer, perhaps every day of our life. Who is this Son of Man, this Messiah in which we put our faith? Who, who is he? And Peter responded and said, and said, 
thou art the Christ, thou art the Messiah in Greek and Hebrew, Messiah and, and Christ, and you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon or Jonah. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but our Father which is in heaven. And he had his highs and lows, as we all have. And I was sharing this morning, I used a word as a, as a very educated word, uh, bamfoozled. I've been bamfoozled all morning, whatever that means. I just couldn't get my thoughts together. But here we are, and we're sharing this good news after Easter that Jesus Christ was crucified, dead, and buried, and was resurrected on the third day. And that's a, certainly a reason to celebrate today. Well, Pentecost doesn't happen until... Um, 50 days after the Passover. Now, the Passover Seder meal is on Monday, Thursday. So, this is uh, 50 days afterwards. And we're ahead of ourselves on the liturgical calendar, so don't get confused. Um, I got confused enough for you. You don't have to. So, here we are, and, and, and Peter is preaching the sermon that is found in Acts 2. Now, the day of Pentecost, as many of you remember, um, that suddenly, as the disciples were in this room, perhaps hiding, perhaps anxious for what's going to happen next, not knowing what's going to happen next, and suddenly all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is not a thing but a person that when we accept Christ as our Savior, we too experience an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other languages. And then the people around them heard the message in their own language. This is not the speaking in tongues, the gift that we know that some people experience but this is where they receive the gospel message in their own language. Now, they were totally amazed. They were convinced that this was an act of God, and they were drawn to the words and excited by the evidence of God's um, empowerment. There is an empowerment that comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit, and when we gather together in worship, we pray that the Holy Spirit comes and empowers the minister and the singers and the youth minister. And we pray that God empowers us as we leave this place to be witnesses for him. And others responded with skepticism. They said um, that the disciples were intoxicated. They are all filled with new wine, he, they said. Instead, they were intoxicated with the Spirit of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I have been in services and in the prayer room and in, in, in uh, prayer myself where I have experienced the um, presence, the intoxication of being surrounded by the Spirit of God. And here we have Peter that is bringing the Pentecost message, and he begins at the beginning of verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Now, we know that Judas has taken his own life, but here, Peter is with the other 11. Now, you may remember that there were two men that they cast lots to decide who would take Judas' place. And the one that was selected was uh, Matthias. So he's here with Matthias and the other 
um, 10 disciples. Now, here's a sideline. This is absolutely free. And I've always remembered this when I came up with this silly little statement. The other man that was not selected, his name was Justice. So if you're ever on Jeopardy and you have that question, the answer is Justice. Well, the way I remember that, I said, well, they picked Matthias, but they wrote a song about justice, and it's just as I am. So um, I know you're groaning right now, but think about that. You'll never forget that answer. He says, he addresses um, the Israelites. He said, you that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Now, isn't that quite ironic that Peter or the, the disciples would say, listen to what I say? How many times did Jesus address his disciples and so many things that happened at the crucifixion and later at the resurrection, they still had not put it together until the coming of the Holy Spirit during Pentecost. He says, listen to what I say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you as you yourselves know. Now this word attested that Jesus of Nazareth attested, approved, showed, accredited, demonstrated the power of his fa God the Father that was used through him. And he says, you've seen, you've seen and, and, and many more have heard because many times Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to do this healing, I'm going to heal this person, but don't tell anyone because my time hasn't come yet. But now the time has come. And he says, um, you yourselves know. So he's preaching to them and saying that they are aware. Now, I'm a firm believer that learning doesn't take place until a person discovers the truth for themselves. You can learn it as a fact, but what he's saying here is, you know, and I know that you know, and, and if you will let that sink in, that, that you and digest that, you will be changed. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God is omniscient. That means that he is all-knowing. And, you know, there are some denominations believe in predestination. Uh, we as Free Will Baptists don't believe in predestination, but we do believe in foreknowledge. When Christ came in the world, uh, this is coming from, uh, I think, Leslie Weatherhead, the will of God, that when Christ came in the world, he came in the world that all men might be saved. Well, all men has the choice and has the possibility of being saved. But then there was the circumstantial will of God because Christ came into the world. Christ came as God incarnate, God in the flesh. He came in the world that all men might be saved, but because of the sin and the evil ways of men, he was put to death. And he was handed over to you according to the definite plan and, and um, foreknowledge of women. And he, you, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. Well, 
those in the law, according to the Torah with the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin were threatened by Jesus, and they turned them over to Pilate and the authorities. He says, but the ones without the law, the Romans are the one that put him to death on the cross. Now, what does the um, cross illustrate? For one thing, the cross illustrates the uh, depravity of human sin. The cross rejects us rationalizing about sin and reminding us that sin is not just ignorance that can be corrected by education. It is not that it can be adjusted and corrected by developing new relationships. Sin is not a moral lapse that can be rectified by turning over a new leaf. Sin is something so tragic, so devastating, it takes the shedding of blood to, from a perfect savior, savior to rectify it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great theologian that died in the concentration camps in near World War II, says that preaching about grace without um, um, without preaching about the cross is a sin, and it's, he called it cheap grace. On the other hand, cross illustrates the depth of divine love. Cross is, the cross is not a human act in turning the wheel of history. The cross is not just something humanity did to Jesus. The cross is something that God did through Jesus for humanity. In the cross, God revealed in history's most sublime way God's incredible love for humanity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 Now, it goes on in verse 25 and says, For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I shall not be shaken. Now here, um, Peter is quoting Psalm 16, 8, 11, and that's a Psalter, P-S-A-L-T-E-R. That's a Psalter that all good Jewish um, men and women would be able to, to recite. And David said he saw David, the great king of Israel, saw God, the Lord, coming before him in his right hand so that he would not be shaken. He said, Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh we will live, live in hope. David, King David, the great King David, was saying that being in the presence of God was reassuring to him and gives, gives him hope. How many times as a, as a people of God, as we look around in the congregation, we, ha we see people um, that look like that they have no hope. But these are children of God, and I have to say this. We had a multi-denomination uh, Passion Week services on um, um, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and Easter morning, and, and then um, um, sunrise service. And I've never experienced, I, I think in many years, the blessings that we came from being with our brothers and sisters in Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit was filled the churches. 
And we were blessed from that worship experience. And then Peter goes on and said, My heart was glad. My tongue rejoiced. My flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades. Hades and Sheol, one is, um, Hades is Greek and Sheol is Hebrew, is the place of the dead where the unrighteous will suffer. He says, but I don't have to resign in, you will not abandon me in this place that is apart from God. Now let me reiterate this uh, for just a moment. I've heard definitions of hell, and we don't like to use that word because it sounds bad. It's, it, it don't sound like um, nice Christian people would use because we don't like to think about hell. Hell exists. Hell is real. Just like to them that Sheol and Hades was real. But you know what someone told me one time was the, the, the scariest, most frightening thing about being in hell, about not committing yourself in obedience to Jesus Christ is hell is the place where you will be eternally separated from God. Etern eternally separated from the opportunity to use your choice to follow Him. Eternally separated to ask God for forgiveness of your sins. Now we know that Christ is coming again. We know that he promised that he would be resurrected. And we know he's coming again. And we don't know that day. And we also don't know the day um, on which that we will go to meet Jesus Christ. So my friends, today is the accepted day of salvation. If you don't know him as Lord and Savior, Confess your sins. Profess that you will follow him in baptism and in obedience to his commands and to live accordingly that you are in the presence of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit and that they are guiding your life. And it's not going to be always easy, but God never said it would be easy and he will be with you. Now he says, um, or let your Holy One experience corruption. Here is the prophecy of David as Peter is recording from his knowledge of what Psalm um, 16 says in verses 8 through 11. You, I, the Holy, the Messiah will not experience corruption as we all will. You have made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Now, I can tell you from experience, and many, many of you, almost, I mean, everyone that knows Christ, knows there's no more wonderful place than to be in his presence. And you know, one of the things that I've learned is sometimes, more times than most people, I have to just be quiet. The psalmist said, Be still and know that I am God. And you know, every time we pray, 
my experience is, is that we need to pause. And we need to listen to God in our prayers. And we need to seek guidance. We need to intercede for others. We need to pray for certain situations. We need to depend on God. And it will make us full of gladness when your presence. And then it goes on and says, fellow Israelites, and here he's not just talking to those that were born in the um, nation of Israel, but those Israelites, the new, new Christians that are following Christ. I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried. And his tomb is with us to this day. They could go to David's tomb. They knew where it was, and they knew that he was, had died and was buried in that tomb. And he goes on and says, Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. He, he promised that one of David's descendants would be on the, on the throne. More definitively, he promised that the Messiah, the Christ, God incarnate, would be put on the eternal throne and it would be forever. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. Jesus Christ, here Peter is preaching to them, and he's saying, King David has died and is in the grave, and his body has decayed. But praise God, Jesus Christ died and was buried, but his body did not decay. He put on a new body, just like we will, and we will be resurrected. Now, Paul tells this in Corinthians. If what he is saying is that we believe in the resurrection. Paul says in Corinthians, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our pro pro proclamation is in vain and your faith has been in vain. We're wasting our time to profess Christ as the Savior and that he has been resurrected if he has not. But praise God, we know from the eyewitness accounts of many people and the pro prophet and the proclamation that, as Jesus said, that he would go into Jerusalem and he would be tried and he would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised again. And then in the last verse, it says, This Jesus God raised up and of that, all of us are witnesses. They had witnessed Mary, the, 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 uh, Mary Magdalene, the disciples, the two men on the way to Mass, and many others have witnessed the, the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And let me close with this blessing from our Lord and Savior. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Lord who lives and reigns with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. One Lord, now and forever and ever.
Amen.